what is going on guys today we're back with another video and i came across this guy uh arvin ash it was in my recommended and he is going to be explaining to us how did the first atom form and where did it come from so in between i'll be trying to stop it and break it down and rebuttal it and questions and then um pick your guys brains a little bit too so i'm excited because he's explaining from a naturalistic scientific point of view meaning that there is nothing beyond us everything did itself on its own and we just don't know so let's go ahead and hop into it this video is sponsored by brilliant stay tuned to the end for a very special offer for arvin ash viewers you and the world around you are made up of millions and millions of atoms heck they're estimated to be more than 10 quadrillion vigentillion atoms in the observable universe that's a one followed by 78 zeros but what are atoms atoms are tiny particles made from electrons protons and neutrons which are in turn composed of quarks but that begs the question, where did these particles that make up the atoms come from in the first place? The short answer is the Big Bang. In the early universe, there was an immense amount of energy. Yada, 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 the energy condensed, atoms formed. But as you might suspect, there's a lot that happened in the yada, yada, yada step. So what really happened? What is the Big Bang really in a scientific sense? The answer, which might surprise you, is coming up right now. online start. To understand what the Big Bang really is in a scientific way, we must take a closer look at what happened in the early universe. But to do that, we need to have some kind of a timeline. This means we need some place where the timeline starts. The truth of the matter is that while the Big Bang is often thought of as the theory explaining the beginning, it's actually not. We don't know anything concrete about when the universe actually started or whether it even did. Okay, I'm going to stop it there. He said that we don't know anything concrete of when the universe actually started or whether it even did. Okay, we know the universe had to start because things are dying. You see stars fizzling out. You see rocks exploding. You see you can look up and see these things. Okay, we have actually figured this out as scientists. OK, so the universe is dying. Our sun will one day no longer exist. It will fizzle out. It will burn out. OK, so we know for anything that has an end had to have had a beginning. So the biggest thing here is that we know that the universe is not infinite. If it has an ending, it has to have a beginning. OK, so we know that this is going to die one day. So this statement here, I already think is incorrect. The most we can do is use our best model of the universe called the standard model of cosmology and use this to turn the clock back to get as close to the beginning of time as we can. But if we can do that, why can't we just turn the clock back to the very beginning at t equals zero? In short, the problem is our theories are incomplete and at some point very close to the beginning of time, the theory becomes unreliable. The theory predicts a singularity, a moment in time when all the matter and energy in the universe, in other words, all of creation, was in an infinitesimally small point of infinite density. Most physicists believe that this is probably wrong. The best we can do is go back up to one Planck time. Listen, did you guys hear that? Just about five seconds ago, he just said all of creation. OK, that's important because basically from a naturalistic point of view, um, they think that creation happened on its own. But they it just sounds like at least this guy, not everybody, even this guy still calls it creation. OK, and as we know, if you don't if you don't know this, let's back it up for a second. If you look around this room, this world, your room, wherever you are, you know that things that have systems that function, that work properly are designed. OK, this monitor, this webcam, this bottle I have on my desk, like it holds water. Everything has a there's nothing that you can look around in this room that ha doesn't have a designer behind it. OK, so that's important because he just called it creation. Let's let's keep going. About 10 to the negative 43 seconds. This is the smallest unit of time that can theoretically exist according to quantum mechanics. We have no idea what comes before this. So although this is as close to the beginning as we can get, it's not quite t equals zero. Even to understand what happens here at t to the negative 43 seconds, 
we would need a quantum theory of gravity because it is here where gravity, the theory of the very large, meets quantum mechanics, the theory of the very small, because all matter and energy, and thus gravity, would be confined, presumably, to the tiny scales of quantum mechanics. This 10 to the negative 43 seconds is considered the first epoch of the universe and is often called the Planck epoch, or era. Around this Planck epoch, we expect that there was a point at which all the forces, electromagnetism, the weak, and the strong force united with gravity, forming one grand unified force. So to build a timeline for our Big Bang Theory, we start before the Planck epoch and set the clock to zero at this point. Keep in mind that this is not really t equals zero, but we start here anyway because it's the best we can do without running into the singularity. There might have been something before, but we don't know. And we also don't know how the universe looked during this epoch or what happened. The earliest time that we can theorize what happened. Okay, I just want to stop it because he said, so basically, they said that we don't know what came before that singularity. Here's what we do know, is that things don't form themselves out of nothing, okay? Whether it be the particles, the, the, the starting point, the atoms, whatever, everything that came together, okay? We know that those things, it's not possible for those things to form on the, by themselves, okay? That's not possible, meaning that basically if we took a box okay and we sucked all the oxygen out of that glass box okay there the elements for oxygen would need to be present with inside of that box to form again okay if you left that box there for 50 million years that box would not form oxygen on its own it's not possible okay so i'm trying to get to is that even if you want to claim that this world universe came from a singularity something had to create those particles and if you want to say oh we just don't know what that something is it could have been another rock exploding our universe guess what something had to create that rock we don't have rocks outside just randomly forming by themselves without some due process in place so i think that's important and i think people should really be paying attention to that because things don't just form themselves something greater had to create that no matter what it is, bro. So. Is around the time of inflation. This happened from about 10 to the negative 36 seconds to about 10 to the negative 33 seconds after the Big Bang. This is when whatever exist existed prior to this time, let's call it the singularity for convenience, grew exponentially fast, faster than the speed of light. This is permissible because there is no theoretical restriction on how fast space can expand. It grew from a point to about the size of a large orange. Now you but basically, I think that's kind of neat is how fast those things happen. Almost like it matches like the description of the Bible. Just saying, because think about God speaking something to an existence and then it happening. You know, I'm, that's what that matches. I'm just saying. All right, let's keep going. You might say, but I thought you can't break the speed of light. But actually, you can. What Einstein found is that information can't be transferred faster than the speed of light. This ensures that you always have a cause and effect. Causality is preserved. But because cosmic inflation occurred faster than the speed of light, it means that two points in space that could affect each other before inflation, in other words, two points that were causally connected, might not be causally connected after inflation, since they moved apart faster than light. The things we currently understand occur mostly after inflation. So the proper way to understand the Big Bang is not some point or object from which the universe started or came into existence, but as a period in the early universe where the universe was very hot, very dense, and expanding rapidly. So the Big Bang is not what happened at t equals zero. It's everything that happened after that. Inflation is thought to have occurred from 10 to the negative 36 to about 10 to the negative 33 seconds. Where did the energy come from to cause this rapid expansion? This problem has not been solved. Cosmic inflation is a process that destroys any information about what came before it. The theory of the standard model of cosmology is really only well understood starting at about 10 to the negative 12 seconds because the universe at this point had energies that can be approximately replicated in current particle accelerators. Prior to this time frame, 
we can only speculate. So anything that we talk about prior to this is largely speculation. We can turn the clock scientifically almost all the way back, but not quite. We don't know much about what happened during the period after inflation, from about 10 to the negative 33 seconds to 10 to the negative 12 seconds. In terms of the forces, gravity is thought to have separated from the unified force shortly after the Planck epoch at 10 to the negative 43 seconds, and later the strong force is thought to have separated at around the time of inflation, 10 to the negative 32 seconds. But from 10 to the negative 32 seconds to 10 to the negative 12 seconds, the electromagnetic and weak forces were still united as the electroweak force. And at this point, the laws of the standard model of particle physics tells us the universe probably consisted of quarks and gluons existing together in a quark-gluon plasma, along with some other fundamental particles. But importantly, at this point, all these fundamental particles were massless because the Higgs field was massless at this point. In other words, it had not gained a non-zero potential that allows fundamental particles to gain mass by interacting with it. Where these initial massless fundamental particles came from is still not known. It's possible they somehow condensed from the energies present at the Big Bang, or there might have been an initial scalar field similar to the Higgs field called the inflation field, which consisted of inflatants that decayed to the fundamental particles we see today. Time takes slightly forward. So well, basically, I think this thing is just explaining it was a giant cosmic accident, which we've heard before, right? The thing is with me, though, is that what we do know is that things don't form by themselves, guys, even life outside, right? If you want to say, well, plants, they form by themselves. No, they don't. They need the correct moisture. They need the correct sunlight. They need the correct soil. They need fertilization. Sometimes they need bees to go back and forth so they can deposit pollen, right? So they can actually get more plants, okay? There's an entire functioning system, okay? It does not form by itself. And if somebody still wanted to claim, like, nah, bro, it's all by itself, I would ask you, I would challenge you and say, okay, cool. So plants form on themselves, okay? So then where did the soil come from? Oh, um, that formed by itself. Or it's just always been here. No, it hasn't. This video is simply explaining to you that this had a beginning. So there's no way for that always to have been there. You get what I'm saying? Is that at some point, something had to create that, bro. Whether it be the singularity they're talking about or the soil or the moisture, like everything has a fully functioning system, bro. And so to explain to people that you're just some big random cosmic accident, I think that's crazy, man. It's like you have to think about from an explosion, when do you get fully functional systems, bro? If your stove blew up right now out in the wilderness, right? Would you come back and expect that thing to have like developed a fully functional restaurant? Like that's not how that works, bro. You know what I'm saying? And actually if the environment around it was damaged enough, right? And there was no oxygen there, that area, there was no moisture, there was no soil, you destroyed it, right? That nothing would happen. It would just be a dead area, bro. But they're trying to explain us that from this explosion came life and uh, it was all just a mere random accident to about 10 to the negative 11 seconds, and the temperature of this hot universe falls a bit further to about 10 to the 15 or one quadrillion Kelvin, the lower temperature and energies leads to something called electroweak symmetry breaking at the beginning of the quark epoch. What happens at this stage is that the electromagnetic and weak forces become distinct and separate forces. This leads to the Higgs field gaining a non-zero potential, which looks like a Mexican hat called a sombrero. This means that the fundamental particles that now interact with the Higgs field gain mass. This is how the particles of the standard model obtain their rest mass. If you want to learn more about the electroweak symmetry breaking and how the Higgs potential causes the particles to become massive, check out my video about electroweak theory. At this point, we have all the building blocks for atoms. Again, the time is around 10 to the negative 11 seconds after the beginning, and the temperature of this universe is around one quadrillion Kelvin. The universe is, however, still too hot for the quarks to combine together to form hadrons, like protons and neutrons. This changes as the universe keeps expanding and further cooling takes place. As temperatures cool to around 1 trillion Kelvin, at 10 to the negative 5 seconds, the quark plasma turns into a hadron gas, consisting of protons and neutrons and some mesons. The mesons are a combination of quark 
anti-quark pairs that eventually decay into photons and electrons. As the universe keeps cooling down, the antiparticles now begin annihilating with particles, creating lighter particle and antiparticle pairs, eventually ending up as the lightest particles, neutrinos and photons. While we would expect that an equal amount of particle and antiparticles would be created, this didn't happen. For some reason, more particles were created than antiparticles, about one in 10 billion more. The reason for this matter-antimatter symmetry is one of the biggest unsolved puzzles in physics. If this annihilation were symmetric, meaning the same amount of particles and antiparticles were converted, then we would have had a universe consisting of nothing except photons and neutrinos. That is, no quarks or electrons, and thus, no atoms. Luckily, there were ever so slightly more particles than antiparticles. So Luckily. Some quarks and electrons survived the annihilation, and protons, neutrons, and electrons that would eventually turn into the first atoms were able to be formed. This annihilation of particles ends with the lepton epoch at around the one second mark. The temperatures at this stage cooled down to around 5 billion Kelvin. Lepton. Do you see this? Like, this blows my mind. It's because if you believe that this was a cosmic accident, we just hear by mere chance, nobody created this. We have no clue what that thing was behind the singularity, okay? That thing behind the singularity points to a greater being, a far, far more educated greater being, okay? But let's just say this for a second. Let's just go back to it was an accident, right? Because what he's explaining to you, if you look at this diagram, you just back it up here just for a second. I want to go back to this. Is he's going through the first process that was an accident the second process that was an accident i'm using my mouse so we got the first process that was an accident the second process that was an accident the third process that was an accident and the accident just keeps going over billions and trillions of years when it comes to them just constant accidents and then life formed by accident and then the ecosystem formed by accident this earth was just placed just far away enough, uh, just far away enough from the sun so that we don't burn, but we don't freeze by accident. The gravitational axis that we have was just pinpoint on by accident. Just one, one big tons and tons and tons of accidents that created us. And we're here all by accident. No, man, somebody created this, bro. This points back to intelligent design. Those processes are explaining to you that these things don't form on their own, bro. That is not possible, bro. But I guess like to some people that put in your faith in an accident after an accident, after an accident, after an accident, it makes more sense than saying, nah, man, I actually think somebody created this. Like that doesn't make sense. I've never seen accident after accident after accident after accident. Like that's not how we got your PC you're gaming on, your PS4 you're gaming on, this fan that's right here, that didn't happen by accident and accident, like these, bro, it's crazy to me, man. At around the one second mark, the temperatures at this stage cooled down to around five billion Kelvin. Leptons are the lightest matter particles and therefore the last particles to finish this annihilation process. After this fire show, most of the matter particles in the universe had been destroyed and turned into photons and neutrinos. But as I said, because of the mysterious matter-antimatter asymmetry, a few protons, neutrons, and electrons were left over, the building blocks needed for atoms. Protons on their own are technically hydrogen nuclei. You can think of them as positively charged or ionized hydrogen atoms. But we're interested in where the stable, neutral atoms come from. To do this, more time had to pass, and physics had to do its thing. When the universe was a few minutes old, the temperature dropped below 1 billion Kelvin, and it reached the point of the Big Bang nucleosynthesis, also called the BBN. Initially, protons and neutrons were produced in equal numbers, but free neutrons are actually not stable, unlike protons. This is related to the fact that neutrons are slightly heavier than protons, making them less stable than protons. If left free, a neutron will undergo something called beta decay via the weak force into a proton in about 10 to 15 minutes. After the protons and neutrons were formed, the temperature was so hot that the conversion from proton to neutrons was equal to the conversion from neutron to protons. But as the universe cooled down, this process changed 
and the decay of neutrons began to dominate. As it turns out, neutrons can become stable when they're in a bound state with other neutrons and or protons, but not on their own. So at this point in the story, it was a race against time for these free neutrons to bind to other hadrons to form larger nuclei before they decay. The Big Bang nucleosynthesis lasts for around 17 minutes until the universe is around 20 minutes old. During this process, a lot of neutrons managed to form bound states and thus survive. But many decayed into protons. Oh, and by this accident. is why we have a lot more protons around today compared to neutrons. The result of this process is that the universe at about 20 minutes has a nucleon content of around 75% hydrogen and 25% helium-4, with very small amounts of deuterium, which is an isotope of hydrogen with an additional neutron, a very small amount of helium-3, and small traces of lithium-9 nuclei. The universe consisted of about 87% protons and 13% neutrons. So we see that most of the universe at this point is just protons or hydrogen nucleons. Pay attention to the fact that at this point in time, it's all ionized nuclei. So only the core of the atoms exist, no electrons bound to them. In order to form neutral atoms, the negatively charged electrons must attach themselves to the positively charged nucleons to balance out the charges. The problem is that the universe is still so hot that the electrons can only attach to the nucleons for a split second before being ripped away because they have so much energy. This also means that at this point the universe is still opaque. If you were there, you wouldn't see anything because the photons that carry light would be constantly interacting with nucleons and electrons flying around. They would not be free to propagate through space. The situation with the electrons and the nucleons is analogous to a spacecraft trying to orbit a planet. If the craft flies... I just want to go back and also note that this is science. He's telling you exactly what they believe to be the process of how this universe formed. Which, again, to me is crazy because if you know in Genesis, God tells us that the Earth was void without form. And this is literally telling you that the Earth had to form. So then your question should be, is how did these ancient uneducated men who wrote the Bible, right, who had no supernatural presence at all, know that the earth was without form and it was void? Oh, it was just a guess. They just guessed right. No, man, that's that's crazy, bro. That is literally insane for them to know that that far ahead of time, bro. That is insane, bro. But we'll just chalk it up to a big cosmic accident. They wrote that down by accident as well. I don't know, man, like people can sit here and tell me that. No, 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 man. No, no, no. There's no God that created this, bro. It's just, it's just an accident. But like when you hear this video, first off, you would have to if you don't want to believe in God, you would have to believe that basically that singularity, it created itself. Or you can just say, I don't know what created it, but you know that that whatever created that singularity had to have been created itself. Do you get what I'm saying? Like, no matter how far you want to go back, you know, as a person that nothing does not make something. I don't care if you're if you think if you believe that we're not talking science anymore. Like, I'm serious. That's not that's not science. Like, nothing does not make something, nor does non life make life. OK, so what I'm trying to explain is that, you know, that that had to have come from somewhere. So not only do you want to reject that. OK, fine. I just I don't know. But you do know that that came from somewhere. Then you have to accept that not only one accident happened, but hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of accidents happened. Not only just to get our Earth to where it is, but then hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of more accidents had to happen so that we can form life and we come from a bacteria. That's what they tell us. Our great, 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 great ancestor was a bacteria that then formed into a tadpole and then a frog and, and then we had life. Okay. So... You have to have tremendous faith to think that all of this created itself on its own, accident after accident after accident after accident. There's nothing wrong with talking about the science behind these things because these do these things do have functioning systems and properties that we can go and research and understand. But what we know as scientists is that things don't make themselves, okay? So that's just crazy to me, man too fast, then it will fly out of orbit. 
so it needs to be slow enough for gravity to capture the spacecraft into an orbit around the planet. The same thing with the electrons, it can't get bound to the nucleon. Now this photon epoch lasts for a very long time, about 380,000 years, until the universe cools down to 3,000 Kelvin. At this point, the electrons have so little energy left that the electromagnetic force can finally bind them to the nucleons for good and form stable neutral atoms. This is now this is where like I think that naturalistic science starts becoming a little bit tricky and they want you to accept this stuff and not question it because if he just if what he just said you know 380,000 years well that doesn't match with a biblical account therefore either one is true one is false which means that you have a choice to make you can accept that he just told you 380,000 years or you can accept what God tells you most people will accept what he just said you know, and they don't think twice about it. This is science, man. They're not they're not talking about religion. They're not biased. They're not. No, man, this is science. But here's what I'll tell you is that. Do you know that they have had like dating like actual our planet and the universe wrong multiple times? And the most recent one I can think of is carbon dating. OK, this was a system they used to date the Earth. And they were like, we found this rock. This might be the oldest rock known in existence is blah, 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 million, hundred thousands, quadrillion years old. Right. And then someone and some more scientists started investigating carbon dating and was like, hey, yeah, we can't use this because this is entirely inaccurate. We have to get rid of this system. This doesn't work. So they come up with a new system. Now, this one's called radiometric dating. OK, and they're using this to push forward more science. Right. They got to have it right this time. You get what I'm saying? And so this is where, like, you have to make a decision. OK, is that you can trust man's word or you can trust God's word. OK, and people will always choose one of the two. Me personally, I'm going to accept that someone created this. And I'm also going to accept that we have a lot of things that we don't understand, no matter how hard we try. I don't care if you want to push this notion that the Earth is 30 billion years old or three trillion years old. OK, if you can get it wrong the first time, you can get it wrong a second, a third, a 14th and a 15th time. OK, because there's things and things there's things that at play that you have no clue. If you know this, this is called the Big Bang Theory. This is just something that's widely accepted by most scientists, naturalistic scientists today. OK, and even some creationists. But remember, guys, popularity does not determine truth. Nobody was there to witness this. OK, nobody knows exactly how old this earth is, but they're going to push it like it's fact. OK, and that has been what they have done from the start of time. He just said that 380,000 years like it was just no problem at all. Like we know that we absolutely know that. Really? Did you use carbon dating, radiometric dating? Did you use the dating before? You get what I'm saying these have been wrong in the past, but they speak on these as if they're fact, bro. So that's where you have to make a decision to trust God's word or man's word. Called recombination. This also means that the photons are no longer bound in this chaos of positive nucleons and negative electrons. They are now free to fly unobstructed through the universe. And we would be able to see this light if we were there in space. The consequence of this today is that everywhere you look, you can see this first light of the universe. This is called the cosmic microwave background or CMB. This light was released as the first stable neutral atoms were formed. So the baby pictures of the universe that you see here is also the record of the first neutral atoms forming in the universe. I made a video about the CMB if you want to learn more. Now the story of how the first atoms in the universe formed is only the beginning of the fascinating journey of atoms. It is a story of only how the lightest elements formed, hydrogen, helium, and lithium, and some isotopes. But as you know, we need a lot more than that for life to exist. So the next question is, how did the rest of the elements of the periodic table form? Particularly, where did carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen, elements essential for life, come from? Yeah, where did all, where did all these things just happen? There's more accidents that happen, guys. Beyond all those accidents you just witnessed in space, more accidents happen so that you can form here all by a cosmic accident. Let's keep going. Not not intentionally. This, this is not designed. OK, all these things that work miraculously together in perfection so that we can be here. It was an accident and more are to come. That fascinating story will be the subject of my next video. So stay tuned for that. In oh, I'm going to go into if it. If you want to learn about how atoms which form the 
molecules that take part in the rich landscape of chemical reactions, you will love a course called The Chemical Reaction. Available. All right, guys. So I'm going to stop it here. All right. Um, I think that this is a, like really an amazing breakdown of actual a scientific point of view of how things work. OK, but to start like um, getting up and and there's people behind this and that will use this and try to claim like bro see we don't need there was no god man there was nothing behind it bro this stuff formed on its own you know we just don't know where that singularity came from bro so we just not gonna call it god you know it's like but you do know again that things don't form on themselves you have to come to that reality as a scientist bro all right so um I think this was a fantastic video. If you guys made this far, smack that like button. If you guys got any challenges or comments, you know, let me know in the comment section. I'll be glad to kind of debate and talk with you guys. That's going to do it for me. I'm out. Peace.